thank you, Connie, for that very kind introduction and also um, for the privilege of being on the stage when uh, that uh, wonderful uh, presentation was shown about uh, Professor Abrahamson. Um, I think what I'm going to try and spend the next 45 minutes or so sharing with you are some of the, I think, important lessons that we can learn from history. Um, 47 years ago, Sim 1 was uh, state of the art. I think what I'd like to share with you is make some connections across the centuries, across the millennia, introduce you to some giants from antiquity. <laughs> Reconnect perhaps with some key ideas from ancient times that we may have lost touch with and explore what makes innovation succeed. I think intuitively you are the innovators of health education. But I'd also like to draw these historical contemporary themes to a more contemporary context in its widest sense. So I'm going to introduce you to this lady, show you this. I'm going to suggest he's probably the first debriefer in educational practice. And I'm going to suggest this individual is probably the first accredited hero in human history. So we'll come back to that. Simulation's nothing new. The, the knights were trained on the quintain, the rotating shield that would hit them on the back if they got it wrong. Some initial thoughts. Values often seen in dollars, pounds, euros, or yen. It's something to do with worth or cost, quality or efficiency. Value is something to do with notion, maybe right or wrong, good or bad. And I think virtue will develop as a theme through this, this, the presentation. But in Spartan culture, and these are pictures of young Spartan warriors tackling lions, it was a virtue to die, and to die gloriously. I'm not sure that would necessarily apply to our society. Now, I work at St. Bartholomew's Hospital, and it was founded by this individual, Ray here. It was founded, well, rather, Ray here is a very interesting character. He was a key player in the court of Edward I. And he went on pilgrimage to Rome and fell ill. And through his stuporous, feverish haze, he had a vision. And that vision was to become a monk and to build a hospital and a priory. And so he did. He survived, he recovered, he went back to London, and he founded the, the priory hospital of St. Bartholomew's the Great. And I suspect every single one of you will have seen it. It was the church in the Sherlock Holmes films. It was the church in Four Weddings and a Funeral. I'm going to introduce a series of ideas. I'm going to introduce 12 in total. The first I'm going to call Paragons. And Ray here, who was this loose living, like, like the wine, like the, the high life, became this revered monk. He became a paragon of virtue, devoted his life to the sick of London. And there he is, to this day, lying in memorial to the left of the high altar in Bart's the Great. Other paragons of healthcare, certainly. I don't know if this crosses the pond, but this is the famous Lady of the Lamp, Florence Nightingale, attended the sick and dying soldiers in the Crimean. This was a lady from Jamaica who was well ahead of Florence, a lady called Mary Seacole, another very virtuous lady. And this is Confucius, a man of very wise words and very deep thought. And so a paragon is a personal thing regarded an exemplar or a particular characteristic quality or virtue. A paragon is also, for those interested, a flawless, greater than 100 carat diamond. So my challenge to you as educators is, are we nurturing such exemplary, flawless clinicians? And if not, why not? Idea number two. I spent six years as Dean of Educational Excellence for London. Now that sounds a little bit sort of... Uh, a little bit um, indulgent. But actually, in Aristotle's own words, we are what we repeatedly do. 
Excellence, then, is not an act, but, an ha but a habit. Are we generating this habit? Is performance always acceptable? Contemporary examples of professional excellence, I mean, clearly Chelsea Sullenberger III knows how to fly a plane, and he's the guy I want at the front of the plane when I'm on an aircraft. The verb to profess, anyone know what to profess means? Or one of its definitions? It's to commit or pledge to uphold a set of beliefs or values, and certainly historically people in medicine used to commit the Hippocratic Oath and excellence, well, that's a little bit more difficult, but Leonardo certainly knew how to paint a painting or two. The challenge, though, lies in defining excellence. And although there are many variants, I know which three I would want. Maybe the Picasso, the Liechtenstein, and maybe the Da Vinci. I can show you what it's not, and I'd be very surprised if anyone knows this building. It's a building in London, but it's, it's such a good, good um, setup, I have to use it. This building is actually called Good Enough College. <laughs> and it's called Good Enough College after its founder, not its aspirations. <laughs> so I'm going to share with you a few ideas that I've developed amongst others in my role in strategic leadership in London and in the English NHS. Um, the Dreyfus-Dreyfus model you'll all be very familiar with, but the point I was really keen to make is that competent is not the same as expert or excellent. And actually there's a fundamental difference in performance by attaining those two goals. I am really uncomfortable with the mediocrity of competency-based training. I think we can do better. To achieve these goals, we need to understand the education performance gap that those two outcomes imply. Health is not a high reliability industry. It is far from it. This is Patient Safety First campaign in the UK looked at um, where health sat on its high risk index. And it's in illustrious company. You have a one in seven chance of harm or potential harm going into an NHS UK hospital. That's several jumbo jets a week. The last Health Select Committee report on patient safety concluded there were over 3,500 patients dying in, in the UK unnecessarily. So what is professional excellence? Well, clearly they need to be able to know something. You need to be able to do things. But if you only know the bottom two tiers, you are but a technician. It's only when you add those higher level professional capabilities, those professional behaviors, only then do you offer the full suite of professional practice. And you'll be very familiar with the non-technical skills. I don't need to labor these points with you. But effective team working is really important. Yes, it's all very well being focused on the outcome, but let's do some risk management as well. And why don't we train people to risk identify and mitigate? Because I'm sure they'll benefit from it. And for those of you who still don't know what situational awareness is, this character needs some. So clearly, we are training reasonable clinicians. But are we training also them in all the other roles that we foist upon them, to be researchers, to be educators, to manage, to innovate? to lead? I think not. And I think if you see it in this light, it really does emphasize how important the central domains of professional capability are, and even more important, how those professional behaviors are at the heart of every professional. It is that shining light that gives them the motivation and the intent to do what they want to do. So I'm suggesting there should be pillars of virtue, values, subtending beliefs, subtending preferences, subtending tendencies. And when you put them all together and you have groups and teams capable, you really do have very strong, elegant structures. But let's not forget the cultural foundations. It's all very well having strong individual pillars, but without solid bound bedrock to set on, they will not stand long. Just a little straw poll. How many of you think crisis resource management is, is essential for healthcare practitioners? Show of hands, please. 
How many of you try to make good decisions, decisions at work? <laughs> and have any of you ever been a good Samaritan? Wonderful. Now, have you ever broken the speed limit? <laughs> so I'm going to suggest that capable expert professionals, i.e. people who can deal with uncertainty, are those who can manage complexity and or chaos. And I think this is an essential characteristic of professionals. Similarly, where there's a high degree of certainty in the bottom left-hand corner, or a high degree of agreement, where things are simple, if you will, should we give insulin to insulin-dependent diabetics, let's make them routine, let's automate. Where things are complicated or complex, this is where you need your professionals for those uh, more divergent and disparate challenges. Similarly, if you look at the bottom left-hand corner, where the task and context is familiar, where there is certainty, competencies are fine. Training is fine. But where you have unfamiliar context, variability, or contextual change, then I would suggest there's a higher degree of uncertainty and would be far more uh, sensible in training people for capability, a flexible, future-proof capacity. We should educate for tomorrow's challenges, but train for today's work. And let's get the whole system working across the whole range of needs and challenges we face. Now, I showed you this clip, this picture a few moments ago. It's actually a plane on final approach to a, an airport in the Far East. There's a little bit of a crosswind. Bit of a skid there at the end. So, Clearly, this guy knows how to fly a plane, and he's obviously got excellent technical skills. How many of you would have liked to have been on that plane? <laughs> so let's look at his decision-making. And actually, that man exhibited, or it's probably a man, um, very risk-tolerant behavior. So I'm suggesting we need to develop people for cognitive capability, so they have the intellectual intelligence to be professional. I'm going to suggest they need technical capability to have the practical intelligence. Similarly, they need the professional intelligences to offer that professional capability. And how are we training our people to have social and emotional intelligence? And moreover, when they're under stress, how are we training them to be viscerally intelligent? Know what I mean? So I've this concept called the parabola. If you go to the bottom left-hand corner where it's level of arousal and performance, right down at the intersection is total anesthesia. <laughs> As you climb the curve, imagine your first coffee, your second coffee, your third coffee, and as you enter that darker optimum zone, that's what you would be called in the zone. That's when it doesn't get any better than this. Watch and weep. But then if you overstress people, they decompensate in an often very catastrophic way, a little bit like the Starling curve, as you remember from physiology. And we should train people to understand this in part of their natural performance. Now, I always used to have a little chuckle to myself when we used to come through customs where we had to sign if we'd ever been convicted of an act of moral turpitude. <laughs> now, I've looked it up, and apparently moral turpitude is conduct that is considered contrary to community standards of justice, honesty, or good morals. And I said this talk would be about antiquity. Well, that actually is a statue of Jupiter. And if you know anything of sort of Greek or Roman mythology, this man was a, this, this god actually was a beast. And he should have had the social services in a long time ago. So London's a global city. Um, we had a bit of a party uh, 18 months or so ago. Um, the Olympics were set to honour the gods, the Greek and Roman gods. The Olympic motto is Citius Altius Fortius, swifter, higher, stronger. And we had some wonderful performances, both creative and physical. And it was a great time, and I'm sure many of you will have enjoyed watching it. it even <laughs> Her Majesty joined in. Um, not all performances were as good as we'd have hoped. 
So, excellence for me, and I don't know if anyone knows this character, he was the head of the uh, Olympic cycling team for the Brits, and they won seven of the ten gold. So he's somebody who knows something about it, and he talks about excellence being an aggregation of marginal gains. And it's something about valuing the right things. And if you also watched any of the Paralympics, although the Olympic motto is swifter, higher, stronger, a little bit quantitative for me, um, if you actually look at the Paralympic motto, it's mind, body, spirit. A lot more qualitative. And actually, as ever, where there are paradox, the integration requires judgment and wisdom. And it's not one or the other, it's a bit of both. So idea three is value. And this story is about ice. Now, ice has been valued since antiquity. This is a Chinese ice store. But I'm going to tell this story in a North American context since we're here. And during the winter, the ice would form on the lakes and teams of men would be sent out and they'd cut the blocks of ice and store them in insulated warehouses. And then they'd send them to their uh, great city warehouses. And then over the spring and summer, they'd sell the ice at massive profit. So take a free resource, sell it for massive profit. Not one of those companies is in existence today. Why? Refrigeration. Very interesting. These companies were at the forefront of refrigeration. They were using it to manufacture ice to sell it to people. Unfortunately for them, Mr. Kelvinator, Frigidaire and Electrolux had a better idea of a nice clean box that sat in the corner with constant coldness. So the moral of this chilly tale is never mistake the activity, shipping ice halfway across North America, for the value proposition, which is milk that stays cold, fish that stays fresh, and beer that stays chilled. And how might we apply this insight to healthcare education? Well, uh, never value teaching over learning. It's not about stacking them high and boring them. It's about how much learning and the eureka moment do we actually create. And what do patients value? Well, my patients value kind, capable, compassionate clinicians. What do employers value? Clinicians who work safely and effectively in teams. What do professionals value? What do you value? Well, actually, it's one of the few things that spans all the generational divides. Actually, professionals value being valued and being given the time and resource to do the many facets of the job as well as they possibly can. You don't go to work to be competent, do you? You go to work to be excellent. What do the public value? Well, certainly in the UK, we're only just starting to ask. And what do governments value? Well, safe, accountable, cost-effective healthcare. So I think I'm going to ask you to reflect over the next few days on what do you value, because it's important. And I've constructed this notion of the value paradox, because the case I've just made suggests that all of these people on all these perspectives have different values or different value. And actually what I suggest is that through dialogue we might be able to develop more of a, a convergence of these values and understandings. So let's talk about affordance. Now affordance is perhaps a term you may not have come across before, but I'm grateful to uh, Peter Dickman for introducing it to me several years ago. And this is based on the work of Kurt Lewin and it's about human perception, behavior, and context. And he asks to you to consider a table. Now, what value would a table have to you? It might be something you sit and work at. It might be something you sit and eat at. But if I put you into a First World War trench warfare, that table takes on a whole new set of affordances potential uses, potential values to you. You might hide behind it for defense. You might break it up for warmth. You might use it to shore up the side of your uh, trench. So this notion of value is contextual, and that's a very important perspective to take ahead. So let's go into the swirling mists of time. And this is uh, before the common epoch, or before Dave Gabba. And let's look at some of humanity's great discoveries. So the discovery of fire 1.6 million years ago, heat, warmth, flexibility. It meant we could head north into the frozen wastes. The evolution of man, um, the handyman, the upright man, the working man. I'm sorry, ladies, it's just the convention. Um, the ancestral man, the Neanderthal man. And 
and Carl Linnaeus called us the wise man. Well, I'm not so sure about how wise. We're ingenious, perhaps, and destructive, definitely, but I'm not sure if we're wise. <laughs> Survival played an important part. There's Carl Linnaeus, and interestingly, for all his very, very accomplished work, and he was a genius by any standing, um, the tree of life and the, the taxonomy of humanity, um, extinction of over 90% of all the species that have ever lived are extinct. Sobering thought. He also was awarded the Order of the Polar Star. Um, that eight-pointed star is very distinct. It's to do with virtues. Another place where they have a, an eight-pointed star is Valletta in Malta. Interestingly, Valletta was founded by Jean de Valette, the, uh, the Grand Master of the Order of St. John. And if you notice how regimented the street scene is in Valletta, it was the first city ever built on a grid pattern in 1565. It was built by the knights, and the eight points are supposed to represent faith, humility, honesty, uh, endeavor, trust, and the, the main tenets of their beliefs. There were several waves of migration out of Africa. Um, they made it to Australia by something like 30,000 years ago when they went walkabout. So over the next two million years, we've built up quite a bit of momentum. And as you can see, for most of modern history, up until about the 1800s, um, we've had a relatively small presence on the world. But as you can see, we're now in the tipping point. Now, I showed you a picture of a lady earlier. And this lady could well be one of your distant relatives. This lady has been called Europa, and if you're non of Af African origin, you have a one in ten chance that she is your maternal bloodline. One in ten. And the rest of you, there's a one in seven chance of all of your bloodlines being traced back to seven mother of Eve's. Phenomenal. They reckon there's only about 2,000 humans at that point. Let's talk about utility. Well, innovation is useless without impact, so a chocolate teapot is no good to anybody. Um, but prehistory, we've been pretty successful. Fire, 1.6 million years ago. The needle, which meant we could have clothes 650,000 years ago. Stone flint or flint tools, 250,000 years ago and cave painting 50,000 years ago. And they think this time, about 50,000 years ago, was of profound importance. Perhaps, indeed, this is the first ever scenario, a hunting scenario or an aspiration of a hunt. And it's also the first sense of self, the handprint, the signature, I was here, and a party, and a prediction of the future. <laughs> Genius. And there was also something about getting organized. So there was a lot more symbolism. And in the Mesopotamian Valley, well, they were fortunate to have 25 of the 37 grain crops available. They worked out that if you planted seeds, you could harvest. So 10,000 years ago, we developed agriculture. And that was a massive step forward for humanity. This is perhaps even the first ever organizational design. Slaves at the bottom. And then as you go up, tradesmen merchants, scribes, and there's the top dog at the top, the pharaoh. So there's something about power. And there's been many significant civilizations, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Greeks, and the Romans, all had their good points, all had their bad points. And famous figures from antiquity, Cleopatra, Julius Caesar, Constantine, founded Constantinople, and Genghis Khan. I'm sure you'll all have individual views of how virtuous each of those individuals were. Antiquity, apparently, traditionally, ends during the, towards the end of the Renaissance. And there are some other interesting Renaissance figures, Leonardo, Michelangelo, Machiavelli. Now, that's where I stop the uh, Mutant Ninja Turtles analogy. And this is Copernicus and dear old Galileo people who suffered very much for their beliefs or their value. So innovation, interesting concept, interesting time. 
What is a good idea? Well, they can be dangerous things, as Galileo found out with the Inquisition. They're usually disruptive for somebody. I'm not sure that sheep and goats and cows had a pretty good view of farming. And also, I think it would be unhelpful uh, to not know that perspective is a very important perspective. And although there are relatively few absolutes, even Isaac Newton got it wrong in some contexts. So a few thoughts on innovation. And Machiavelli had some very poignant words to say. There is nothing more difficult, and just wonder if this relates to any of your daytime challenges within your workplace. There is nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things. For the reformer has enemies in all those who profit by the old order, and only lukewarm defenders in all those who would profit by the new order. Sound familiar? However, I'm an optimist, and I still believe chance favors the prepared mind. And first, you need a brain. And if we take a humanistic view of this, the phenomena 1.0 was life, phenomena 2.0 was consciousness, and the phenomena 3.0 was the capability of social beings. And so let's, let's work this through. You need a brain, then it needs to think, then it needs to make sense, then it needs to act, then it needs to reflect and learn. And these are core human qualities which we've demonstrated over time. 1.6 million years ago, we discovered fire. We were also hunting animals. We domesticated animals 10,000 years ago. So why, oh why, oh why, did it take till 1940 for McDonald's and 1953 to get the burger sorted out? So let's talk about creativity because without innovation, there's no creativity. And Going back through antiquity, there are many examples of an innovative idea. I wonder what if I stick a stick in there. And refining the wheel, um, you can see... persist because I think it's worth it. Where lived the inventor of the device that has brought to generations of beautiful girls the healthy exercise known as having to walk home. As he worked at his wheels, the simple Briton Hengist Pod would listen to his wife telling him what he should do with them. Wheels, 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 that's all you ever think about. Doesn't matter about me, oh no. Never mind about taking me out for a bit of fun sometimes. It's all really while you're sitting there making perishing wheels all day long, but what about me? What sort of life do you think it is for me? Nothing but the same dreary old round day in, day out, stuck in this miserable hovel with nobody to speak to all the time while you go your own sweet way. Scraping and screwing. Scraping and screwing, trying to make ends meet, trying to keep a roof over me head with precious little help from you. Fingers to the bone. Working my fingers to the bone, washing and scrubbing and clearing up after you. Hot ash pit. Slaving away over a hot... Pretty what? Uh, pretty name. It was, till I married somebody called Pod. Well, must excuse my wife, she's not quite herself. Poor old mother was eaten by a brontosaurus a few days ago. Oh, that was too bad. Yes, you're right. Brontosaurus died within the hour. How much do you want for your wheel? Oh, I don't know, I've never saw one before. People don't like new ideas, you know. I'll have it. What, just a one? Well, what good would that be? I'll show you. Yeah. Hey, hey, what are you doing? Look, they support the rim. It'll be no good without them. Watch. Hey. There we are. Makes a perfect frame. Oh, so it does, yes. But what's that a square opening in the middle for? Oh, it's just an idea I had for letting in more light. I thought I'd call it a window. A window. Oh, we can call that a window rim. Yeah. 
What about window frame? Oh, well, if you like, it's all the same. <laughs> and so the good people of Cockyham went about their very simple business, blissfully unaware that... So the challenges of both technology and innovation uh, it clearly illustrated there. So it's something about abstract ideas, getting the ideas together, sowing the seed, that Eurocom moment. Then it's rational exploration, principles and rules. And if you can use the cloudy wedge analogy, which I've sort of suggested might be useful, there's an intuitive leap that has to be made. And then you have the rational and the precise description of what's going on. So the left-hand side's the realm of art and imagination, and the left is science and industry. And you need both to, to innovate. It's not either one or the other, it's both. Frugal innovation can also be lean and can be dangerous. But if you think about the capacity on your phone, a lot of you probably don't use anywhere near the capacity of your phone overall. Are you training your people to be capable innovators in this sense? And I think if you look at the track record of antiquity, there are many things for us as humans to be proud of. The sowing of seed and the ideas spread, they often do go viral and they can be very well utilised. So there are many things that constitute a useful idea and I'm just going to draw your attention to the bottom two about the importance of behaviour and the way we organise things. And so I'm going to talk about virtue, which is... I think quite an important area of professional practice. There are many contemporary historical figures, Mother Teresa, Gandhi, uh, Abraham Lincoln, Mandela. Does anyone know who that bottom, this character on the top two in next to Joseph Stalin, anyone know who that is? This is Edward Jenner. Edward Jenner. And that one man has probably saved more human beings than anyone in the history of humanity. He invented the smallpox vaccination, but he also invested, in, invented the sort of the techniques of vaccination. So if you think how many people are alive today because of him, and it is with some irony that I've placed him between Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin, people who can certainly not claim to have done those things. So an idea often has a legacy. It has perceptions, thoughts, interpretations, ideas, they get reinforced and become a belief, a notion. That strongly held belief then becomes a value. It's something I believe in. And the values then, if they're shared collectively, become a belief system. And do not underestimate the importance of belief driving behavior. It is central. How many of you have got visa cards? Well, visa was invented by a very interesting rather maverick Texan rancher, a guy called D. Hock. And he suggested you should promote people on the following characteristics, and I'll go through them and explain why in a moment. Promote first on the basis of integrity, then motivation, third capacity, fourth understanding, fifth knowledge, and last and least experience. And he said so on the basis that, without integrity, motivation is dangerous. Think journalist, think politician. We've had a horse meat selling scandal in the UK. Without motivation, capacity is impotent. If you can't be bothered, you're not going to be any good to anybody. Without capacity, understanding is limited. And without understanding, knowledge is meaningless. This, if you will, is what wisdom is. Phrenesis, applied understanding. And without knowledge, experience is blind. And how often, do we often, how often do we appoint on experience without considering motivation, integrity, capacity, or wisdom? And I think we do so at our peril. When belief and value systems get organized, they often represent as religions, and there have been many goes at it over the years. And a lot of the great religions have the great books, the social wisdom of the age, these are pillars of the command and commandments. Do not kill is a pretty common uh, testament across most of the great religions. And they use proverbs and sayings. What are the medical proverbs and sayings that we might use? Do as you would be done by. One good turn deserves another. The parables, stories of moral guidance, the good Samaritan I've asked about you already. And 
the parables give these com complex, challenging, ethical contexts that people then have to analyze. The black and white is easy. It's the gray that where the professional comes into their own. And this is true. In the UK National Census in 2010, 390,127 people said they were a Jedi Knight. <laughs> 70,000 said so in Australia. Good day. 53,000 in New Zealand. 21,000 in Canada. I'm not sure what the states did, would be. Czech Republic, 15,000. Serbia, 640. And Croatia, 303. So may the force be with you. So other great books, Aesop's Fables, another uh, moral-based guidance tale. Uh, Grim fairy tales, Winnie the Pooh, Harry Potter, they all have a moral dimension. Aesop understood the power of stories, the power of words. I talked about complexities where professionals live. We should be using these powerful stories, these proverbs, or constructing our own equivalents in terms of parables, fables, myths and legends. There will be myths and legends in your departments, heroic daring do. Uh, let's look at engaging memorable scenarios. Let's look at the power of metaphor, the power of the written word. Mankind used to use stories to explain the unknown. They were sense-making. Lightning used to be Thor's anvil or Zeus's lightning bolts. We used to sacrifice bulls and humans. We used to, not that long ago, drill burr holes to let the vapors out. Um, a lot of this is about keeping calm and carrying on. It does have value, uh, but it's nonsense. So mythology can be quite important. It's about the behavioral message. It's bad to kill people, at least in your own tribe. So you need to understand the value and importance of stories in passing on knowledge from generation to generation whilst maintaining social fabric. Think about those informal conversations, the recounting of a story, the anecdote, the metaphor. These are very powerful teaching devices. Icarus is escape from Crete about pride coming before a fall. And the 12 labors of Hercules. And as I said earlier, he's probably, because of his success in those endeavors, the first ever, and this is him receiving his laurel leaf, his first ever accredited hero in mythology. There is other contemporary braveness. This is Bruce McCandles in a very, very lonely position. And just turning briefly to the dark side, because there are, there's another V which I didn't mention, which are the vices. And if you want a really interesting read, read what happens to people who partake of those. Um, but the vice is the opposite of virtue. So professionals are highly flexible, adaptable, and valuable. My challenge to you, although they have many exceptional qualities, they are rarely flawless. Mythological local figures. Uh, I think we're in San Francisco, aren't we? So Dirty Harry's one of yours. So. I've just got a little bit, I'm going to try and make somebody's day. It's an act of uh, unconditional self-regard. So if you could just check under your seat, and uh, check under your seat, I've put an envelope under a chair with $20, $20 in it. And it's just a little gift for me to one of you to say thank you. Has anyone found it? Hooray, there's one at the front. Well done. So that's just a little act of having a, a little something other on my behalf. So let's look at an unconditional act of kindness. Was it a virtuous act? What is, the Greeks call it agape. And the final thought I want you to leave you with is wisdom. Pythagoras was probably the first philosopher, Aristotle the first teacher, Socrates the first debriefer, and Plato the first spin doctor. <laughs> and almost certainly Hercules was the first accredited hero and so my challenge to you is given that I've shared with you 12 uh, ideas, your task is to adopt, like Hercules, the 12 challenges, the 12 labors of Hercules, and wonder how you can create paragons of excellence, focus on value, not process, look at value and utility, and understand the importance of creativity and innovation and virtue. 
Please use stories and please cherish wisdom. Philosophy is, after all, the love of wisdom. And just to reinforce that, Confucius 3,000 years ago said, by three methods we may learn wisdom. First, by reflection, which is noblest. Second, by imitation, simulation again, which is easiest. And third, by experience, which is the bitterest. So although there's many theocracies, probably the most powerful at the moment is something like that. And so my appeal would be to consider who and what is your moral compass? And finally, history cannot give us a program for the future, but it can give us a fuller understanding of ourselves and of our common humanity so that we can better face the future. May the force be with you over the next few days. Thank you. Uh, and thanks again for um, helping us connect to our past, making those connections. <clears throat> At this time,